Welcome back, everyone, to our monthly meetup gathering of the Financial Freedom Through Apartment Investing Meetup. And we are a GOB network of apartment of investors affiliate. And on this platform, we pretty much educate, we empower, and we connect people to wealth. So today we have one of GOB's own, which I'm pretty sure you guys know very well throughout LinkedIn land, Mr. K. Trevor Thompson, who will be sharing with us today the intricate insights of asset management. And for those who is not familiar with Trevor, uh, a brief bio on him, he has invested in multifamily uh, apartments, over a thousand doors, retail strip malls, one con one townhouse to condo conversion, which is 28 units, uh, single family rental portfolio fund of 250 homes. He also has participated in a ground up multifamily fund of 100 doors, a medical office building, uh, land development near the Tesla, the new Tesla factory in Austin and storage unit in my new hometown of Charlotte. He is an avid learner, continually connecting with as many like-minded people in the space as possible. And now he has gotten the bug to get on the active side so he has been actively looking for a multi-family um, property as a GP and asset manager. Um, and he is also Boots in good old Texas. Trevor, welcome to the platform, sir. Glad to have you on. I'm glad to be here. And unfortunately, I don't have cowboy boots, though. Just regular <laughs> girl boots. <laughs> I've never owned no a pair words. of cowboy boots. I feel kind of like funny. <laughs> No worries. I, I'm actually looking to get a pair of boots and, and the whole ensemble, the, the boots, the hat, and the belt buckle. So when I visit Texas pretty soon. So yes, yeah, sir. So while the platform is yours on where, where we have eager ears who are looking to learn more about asset management, since that is your forte, uh, feel free. I, you should have sharing capabilities to, to, um, to do your presentation. Okay, awesome. Let me, uh, let's see. All right, can you tell me if you got my screen? Yes, sir. Awesome. All right, very good. Is, is it all good? You got it? Hold on. There it is. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I have a PowerPoint. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly, because I think most of the value you're going to get is out of conversations. So obviously, um, thanks, Mark, uh, for inviting me. Um, you know, we connected a couple of years ago and uh, see each other regularly on different meetups. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, one of the things that's sort of interesting, right? In theory, I've never been an asset manager, even though I was a volunteer asset manager. So you think, how in the world can this guy talk about it? Well, because I'm obsessed with it. And I've studied it and I've learned and I've gone to paid courses and I actually was a volunteer asset manager on one of my properties. So I'm going to go through a little slide presentation. Hopefully it's not too long. It's the first time I've presented it. There's a lot of stuff on the slides. I'm not going to read them all. This uh, You could read them and I'm going to share this with Mark. So if anybody wants to look at it later, um, we could do it. So as Mark mentioned, I'm based in Austin, Texas. I'm an accredited investor and actually since I gave him my bio, I invested in one more deal and actually got a small GP share of it uh, with 66 condos in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, so I've been quite bright. So here is all of my investments. So the very first one was 58 doors. The first two investments I made went full cycle and sadly I made no money. So that's one of the things they tell you though, it can be risky. I did not lose my capital. And this particular one, I was asset manager in 19, in 2020, which we all know is a wonderful year. Um, so I started in January for about 10 months. And here's a list of all, most of my deals are in Texas, except for this is South Carolina, this is Charlotte, and then I have one in Tucson, Arizona. Um, and uh, the Tucson, Arizona one, I invested with Gary Lipsky. If anyone's followed him, um, he basically was my mentor, him and Kyle on asset management. Um, so I spent the past 20 years up until COVID uh, working for iFly Indoor Skydiving. So if you have one in your town, chances are I opened it. The closest one to you, Mark, is in Concord, and I did open that particular location. 
I opened 46 of them um, near the end, very exotic, Brisbane, Australia, uh, uh, Sam, uh, Perth, Australia, Queenstown, New Zealand, Brisbane, um, uh, Sao Paulo, Brasilia, Brazil, lots of exotic locations. And then over the past few years, I've been deeply passionate about learning about uh, connecting with people and doing real estate. So know your superpowers. Mine is connecting, networking, management, which I plan to convert to be a strong asset manager. It's not making great PowerPoints. So I've done my best to create a nice PowerPoint here, but it is not my superpower. So I wanna start out talking a little bit because a lot of people get this confused. The difference between asset management and property management. So asset management is concerned with the long-term bigger financial picture. They are responsible for maximizing revenue and the potential, controlling cost, and tracking the results of the property. In short, they're responsible for implementing the new mess of creating long-term additional value in the asset. So often we talk about, oh, this is a forced appreciation deal. Well, if it's a forced appreciation deal, the person really involved in coming up with the plan, making sure the plan happens, is the asset manager. Then there are property managers. These are normally third-party companies that are hired by the asset manager. And the property manager focuses on the day-to-day -day operations of the rental property. And I'm talking mostly multifamily here tonight. There's all different types of assets. You can obviously do it. So the property manager acts on the behalf of the owners in routine tasks such as rent collections, administration of leasing, schedules of maintenance, repairs, and most importantly, tenant relations. So they are the person that is day-to-day -day doing the work and they are managed by the asset manager who is normally part of the ownership team. There are third-party asset managers that you can hire, but the majority of the deals, it is a couple of the GPs, the lead sponsors that are responsible for managing the deal and making sure everything happens. So where do you find out what it means? You look at Wikipedia, right? So this is a long thing. So it's a systematic approach to the governance and realization of value from the thing that a group or entity is responsible over the whole life cycle. Um, it's kind of technical, but it really is, right? They're responsible for everything. It's a systematic approach of developing, operating, maintaining, upgrading, and disposing of an asset in the most cost-effective member manner, including all risks, all costs, and performance attributes. Um, key responsibilities of an asset manager are creating the overall strategy for each rental property, the entire real estate portfolio, if you have more than one, improving the asset value by wisely reducing expenses and increasing income. They're hiring and overseeing the property manager, preparing, monitoring, and adjusting the property financials to meet the projections and the financial strategies. So your asset manager is the one that is really the, the person who's responsible for the forced appreciation. They take a property, they reduce expenses, they improve income, they make it better, therefore they create a bigger value in the property. This is a mind blowing chart, I'm not gonna talk about it at all, but these are kind of like all the things they do, right? So we're not gonna get this a little bit overwhelming, but these are kind of a list of all the responsibilities that they do. Okay, so the asset manager is responsible for creating the business plan and property performance plan for the investment. So when you go to a webinar, what's happened is, is the team has gotten together and they've created this plan, right? And they tell you, hey, rents are this, we're gonna put rents to that. There's this much mismanagement in the property, we're gonna fix it by this. Hey, we're gonna add covered parking. We're going to add preferred parking. We're going to start adding some amenity charges. We're going to install valet trash. Whatever the plan is, the asset manager is responsible to make sure that that gets implemented. So the business plan will state the assets investment time horizons down to the project rent unit. So you see this whole thing. And then there's a metric of measurement that the managed asset manager will use to ensure that they leverage the most strategic investment plan thus maximizing. So for example, let's say they start bumping rents and they fill up quickly. Well, what's a good asset manager gonna do? Bump the rents again, 
right? So what if they bump the rents and leases are taking some time? What would a good asset manager do? Say, okay, listen, we need to maintain stability. We need to stay occupied over 90% or whatever their goals are. So we're gonna offer some concessions. We're going to do this in marketing. We're gonna drive the different things. Um, you should expect that the asset manager knows the numbers the best. They constantly perform competitive analysis on a market to make sure. So they're the ones that are getting the rent comps. They're the ones that are checking out the competitors. They're the ones that are talking to different property management companies to get it. And then the asset manager frequently adjusts their rent rates or the property's budget accordingly, right? So it's, it's a fluid thing that happens on an ongoing basis. Okay, so there are really six main reports that your property management company is going to give you. And these are financial reports that are normally come out with your financial predictions from your property management company. Okay, so the first one is a balance sheet. So prop, an asset manager again has to be able to read a balance sheet. The balance sheet is a snapshot of the financial performance of the property as to the date of the report. It's a summary of the assets, liabilities, and equity of ownership. So it's the one that's tracking kind of everything, right? Um, monthly income and expense reports, okay? This is in theory your checkbook, right? So this report has a month to date and a year date, and it breaks down income and itemized expenses, and it should be compared with the budget or the plan, right? So our budget was this, and we're at this, therefore the delta is that, and then a good asset manager says, what am I going to do to adjust that delta? So I have to make some revisions. I have to make a plan, right? So we bump the rents up 150 bucks. We're not quite getting it. Hey, let's offer a first month's free rent or a concession or do something. And you need to be constantly balancing out the plan. So the plan says, hey, we're going to have to do this to implement uh, some water savings, some other things. So again, the asset manager is going to do all that. And the income and monthly expense statement is what I'm gonna call is a very important scorecard for that. Okay, and then there's a general ledger. Um, it provides a detail of individual transactions and the total number reflected on the balance sheet. So these are things that should line up, okay? Then very importantly is an accounts payable report, okay? So what a lot of times happened, one of the ones I was volunteering asset management, they were spending money and not posting the invoices to stay on budget. Well, they really weren't on budget, right? Because what they did was they spent the money, they didn't post the invoice, therefore it's not a fair reflection of the property. What's happening at the property? Where are our expenses? How much is it costing us to do all, all of these things? So what you need is you need a really good accounts payable. So here's my receivables from my rent or other van or everything, and here are my payables. And if you don't have a really good system that tracks those two, just like you track your own personal checkbook, right? You just kept writing checks, never did a balance of it, never did an accounts payable, just kept paying the bills, you might get in trouble. And then there's the tenants receivables and prepaid report. So sometimes tenants pay you deposits, they pay their rent early, they have different things. And then this ledger will also talk about delinquent tenants, okay? So you need to make sure that you understand who's paid their rent, what date have they paid their rent, when do they promise to pay their rent if they're late, have we been charging the late fees, have we been charging, because again, all of these fees are part of your plan to give you your um, much needed income coming in. And then there's a copy of the monthly bank statement. Okay, bank statements don't lie, so you get a copy. This is the checks that were written, this is the money that comes in. And these types of financial reports are provided you by the property but so the owner can avoid unnecessary expenses and losses and ultimately regain control of the asset. Okay, so what's the most important thing? These are to me are the most important things that you wanna track, right? I call this show me the money. Okay, why do you have an apartment complex? To lease apartments, right? That's why we have an apartment complex. Why do we think what would the plan is to improve the apartment complex, build up the rents, do different things. So very important reports that you need is what is my occupancy today, right? So every, let's say it's Monday morning, I wanna know what is the occupancy? 
I want to know how many units are pre-leased. So let's just make it easy, right? I've got 100 units. I've got 90 under current contracts. And I've got two more leases moving in this month. So I know, okay, I'm at a 92%. But what I need to know is a little more information. How many people came in and applied to get those two apartments? Because that's going to tell you a lot, right? It's going to tell you, is your marketing bringing people that can't afford, don't meet the property requirements? Is your, you know, all the different things that are happening? Or is your property manager just approving everybody? We had two people approve um, and we approved two people apply, pardon me, and we approve those two people, well, you really need to dig down deep and go, okay, are we just approving anybody or did we get lucky and two qualified tenants applied to get into the property? So these are the things that you really need to understand and it's going to help you with your, where am I spending my money? Am I, you know, am I on, on a particular ad? Am I getting Facebook messages? Am I buying ads? Am I getting tenant referrals? Wherever it is, you want to know. I would say typically, if a property is approving more than 60% of the applicants, you have some problems with the approval process, right? You need to be, especially in deep value add type projects and whatever. Okay, then you need a report of vacant units. Are they rented or not rented? Okay, um, and so how many vacants? Because you have to tie all these things in with the reports. And some of it comes in your occupancy, but it doesn't quite do the same, right? So you may have, okay, I got a report on uh, April 1st and a tenant moved out April 4th. Um, so I need to know that, right? So that's why we're talking about the move in and move outs. And that's how you make this plan, right? So if you've ever seen when you first go to a webinar for a thing, okay, we're going to take 12 months and we're going to renovate this many units over a period of time. Well, how do you come up with that plan? You look at lease expiration dates and you say, okay, I'm going to evict a certain percentage of those and or try to renew them with no renovations at a higher rate. And you have this big balancing act um, that you want to do because what you don't want to do is, unless you're doing a property turn, you don't want to kill your occupancy. Now you may say, hey, I need to do, I need to do a big turn and burn, right? So I need to get rid of half of the residents as quick as possible so I can reposition the property. But these reports will all help you do that. And then you need to know units ready or units down. So you could say, okay, I'm at 90% occupancy on 100. So that means I have 10 units to renovate. Well, if only one of those units are, sorry, to lease, pardon me. So I have 10 units to lease, but if only one of those units is ready, you actually only have one unit to lease. So then you need to say, okay, when is this one going to be ready? When is that one going to be ready? And you have your make ready schedule because what you don't want to do is get this imbalance where, you know, okay, I'm at 90%, I'm stabilized, but I have nothing else to rent and I have Sally moving out next Wednesday. So again, this is deep in, dig, digging deep into the weeds, but this is exactly what a good asset manager does. They dig into the weeds so that they protect your invest, your investment. And then delinquencies, promise to pay, and a follow-up timeline. So we're gonna pick on Mr. International. He hasn't paid his rent. I don't know why he hasn't paid his rent. And he told Sally at the office, he's gonna pay his rent on the 28th. Okay, so on the 28th, she's gonna be going, Mr. International, where's your rent check, buddy? You're like 28 days late. And then she's gonna start chasing on the first and we're picking on him. We know he pays his rent, um, but uh, you know, but you gotta make sure you have that and that, that you're tracking that. These are the things that fall through the cracks quickly. Um, all of a sudden you wake up and you realize, you know, I'm 90% occupied, but my economic, which means the people that are paying me is 85%, 82%. And these are numbers that are significant because when a bank looks at your, your things, they're going to look at your economic vacant occupancy, and that's the things that are going to give it. Now, another huge thing about apartments, and it talks at the top there a little bit about heavy, happy residents. How are you doing with work orders? Are you tracking work orders? So how many work orders did we receive? How many are completed? And what's the average time to complete them? This is huge. So if you're going to take a property that's been neglected, been poorly managed, 
the most easiest way for you to reset your tenants expectations is to provide excellent service. Hey, Sally, my AC's down. That's okay. Dan's going to be there in 30 minutes and he's going to fix it. So Dan comes in, he goes and does it, says, man, you know, we got, we got 44, 48, 6 billion bucks from Elon Musk. We can fix your AC. In fact, we can buy a new one. Um, no, but, so, but you want to have these things and you want to make sure that these things are happening and that reports are actually getting entered into the system correctly. This is a big hide and seek game that a lot of property managers want to do. Oh no, we've covered all of the trouble tickets. You know, you really got to, to do it and you really got to do the average time. I call it the what by when, right? A lot of apartment asset management is the what by when. We've got this many units with issues. When are we going to get there? And then we're going to report that it's done. Now, the last one you're going to look at is your Google reviews. And there's lots of ways. There's Facebook, there's posts, and tenant surveys for complaints or compliments. I um, want to talk a little bit about this. So you need to be monitoring these things, right? If all of a sudden you see all this chatter again, we bought this property. We've told our investors we're going to improve the property. We're going to increase the rents. And now all of a sudden, all we got is complaints, right? Now, yes, somebody will say, man, those people, they increase the rent. But hopefully what they're saying is these people have really fixed up the property. These people have fixed the gate on the entrance. The mailbox works. The pool's back open and it's clean. The kid's playground is done. Man, the dog park is amazing. In fact, I go to the office and the lady in the office gives my dog a treat. Um, you know, they went from hating dogs to being this dog friendly property. So these are the kind of things that are really important for an asset manager to be able to dig down and get this information. And sometimes this is the hardest because there's this fine line between you and the tenants, right? You do not want to get in the middle of the property manager who's responsible for the tenants, but you need to make sure that you're getting all of the information back to you so that you're making good, wise business decisions. Okay, property visits. Um, I always talk about I'm gonna be boots in the ground in Texas. I don't have my Texas boots yet, but it's very important to walk a property. Photographs can be manipulated to make, have you ever seen like photographs to go buy a house and you get in the house and you go, is this the same house or is this whatever? Um, you know, you wanna make sure that you are actually physically going to the property and see it, okay? You should do both planned visits and surprise visits, okay? Um, so, hey, I'm gonna be coming into town, I'm gonna be doing this, so this is my day to go there or whatever it is, and then you need to do surprise visits, okay? If you're not seeing the property yourself, you don't really know the quality of work or care in the property, it's vital to be there in person. So when you visit the property, you know, a lot of people just go there and follow up on their list. No, visit the property as if you're a new tenant. Pretend you're in the car and you got your spouse with you and you're thinking, we're going to talk about living here. And when you pull up to the gate, do you think, oh, this is the place I'd like to live? As you drive around the property, do you think, oh, this is a place we'd like to live? Go by the dumpsters and it's full of abandoned sofas and there's stray cats everywhere and all kinds of stuff going on. You can tell that the pool's kind of green looking, the furniture's been blown over, the kids' playground doesn't look like it's had mulch for three years. So you want to visit the property with the mind of, I've never seen this property before and I'm thinking of living here. So do, does it look inviting? Do I want to rent? Is the office inviting? All of those things. Walk every inch of the property. Don't just look at what's on your list. Walk every inch of the property, day and night visits. Properties look uh, totally different at night than they do in the day. Do you have dark zones? Does certain things work? There's a lot you can tell about a property more at night about the care of the property. Tour every vacant unit and inspect all make readies. So we've got these three apartments. This one's gonna be ready on uh, Tuesday, this one on Thursday, this one on Friday. You should be inspecting the work and make sure that it's up to your qualifications. 
Uh, again, you want to set the standard of everything. Um, you want to visit every amenity. Go to the gym and actually sit on the bike. Who's gone to a Holiday Inn Express and gone and usually elliptical I do? And they're horrible. I don't think that manager in the Holiday Inn's ever ridden that elliptical. Um, do it at the center. You want your tenants to say, oh man, these guys improved the property. They put in a nice elliptical. It's a piece of junk um, that you can't, you can't even ride on. So actually ride on it. You may not swim in a swimming pool, but pretend like you would at least be there. Um, walk the property with the maintenance team. Hey, can I follow you for a while? Can I spend some time with you um, just to get to know them and make sure what it's doing? This is something that a lot of people miss. Look for things to praise the team. When you get a good Google review, ask to go see, you know, this person and say, man, this Google review is amazing. You know, shake the hand, give them some sort of gift certificate, whatever it is. Don't just go there and complain about what's wrong. Find out what's right and reward it. Um, and then it's important to leave with a plan with dates again. I keep talking about this, what by when to make sure, and then make sure you give them the resources to be done. So they've been asking for an extra maintenance person on a part-time basis. You've said no for a year, but you're not going to, you expect them to get the, the, the make work ready tickets done earlier, or they don't have anybody to do the make readies and you're mad because the make readies. So again, as the asset manager, you got to make sure that you're equipping your property manager to be successful. Okay. So I told you I was a big fan of Gary and Kyle. That's my reading. Um, everybody should get a copy of their book on Amazon. I asked them if they had a link, but they don't. You just got to go to Amazon and buy it. But it's an awesome book. And then questions. Hopefully that was good. And I don't know how you do the format, Mark, if people just unmute and ask questions, whatever, whatever they want to do, you want to do, I am willing to do. Because your GOB zone, Trevor, will just let people just unmute themselves and just ask the questions. Oh, go back to the book. Sorry. So actually, I'll just put a link in the chat instead of re-making everybody disappear um, for the book on Amazon. Any other questions? Do they do such a good job that they don't have any questions? Trevor, you always do such a great job. <laughs> Thank exactly. you. Exactly. Trevor, I do have one question for you. The, the property managers, are they creating a full report for the month and turning that over to the asset manager? That's or... correct. They should be doing it weekly and then some things are monthly. So do they send out like a monthly summary of, of is that That's to be correct. Expected? So when I was doing it every, every Monday morning, they ran all of the reports mm -hmm. and that's there's a link to the book and they would give you the all of the reports would it be would it be, be better for them not to just probably give me access to the system when like Definitely i have a read only access mode to the system if you can get it the only mm -hmm. thing you got to make sure is that that you don't manipulate you know you kind of made them responsible some property managers yeah. won't, but most will um give you access to the system and you can run your own reports but again it's just nice um, if you get the, you know, if, if, if you make them responsible, as soon as you make yourself responsible, yeah. you've now taken away their accountability, right? So I want my reports Monday morning by this time. Our call is Tuesday or this time, and we're going to review these reports and, you know, and, and do all those things. You want to keep it their responsibility, right? You're managing them to implement your plan. Yes. You come up with the plan, you hand it over to them to implement. And in fact, you should work on the plan together, right? So normally, mm -hmm. again, I know when a lot of us are underwriting properties and looking at properties, we've already contacted a property manager. We've got to, are we realistic? Are we doing things? It should be a team effort, but at the end of the day, it's the asset manager's responsibility to make sure that the plan is implemented for the investors. Got it. No, thank you, Trevor. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Trevor Nelson from Austin, Texas. Hey there. I have a question for you. How much in a GV deal, how much does it manager charge on my first multifamily deal 
purchase price 3.1. If so, someone offered me like 6 to 7% of the gross income, is that typical standard price? So, so the, normally an asset manager is part of, a, they're the ones who are putting the deal together and managing the deal. Um, so, you know, that's negotiated to what percentage of the GP that person on the team gets um, okay. for everything. And then normally, I didn't put this in the presentation, normally the asset management fee is 2%. All of that doesn't go necessarily to one person because it can get split by the team. But there is one person who is, that is their main responsibility in the group, right? So they're the ones that are responsible for running the business. So this is a JV deal. He got they got a slice only of two percent, one to two percent of the hundred percent of the equity. Doesn't matter what deal it is. It's a matter of what you what the, what's negotiated in the deal, right? So an asset manager fee in a normal deal is two percent of the gross revenue. That's a normal monthly fee that they get. Um, has nothing to do with acquisitions. That's a whole separate bucket. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So we had two more questions. Ashley, okay. I'm not sure if you're able to unmute yourself and ask your question. If not, I'll... Yeah. Yes, sure. Um, so I was basically asking, like, how do you determine, like, when you're looking in the underwriting and stuff, like, how do you determine what is the best business plan? And, like, if it's all, I guess, implementable uh, and realistic in that market and, like, determine how soon you can implement the marketing plan, like when, whenever you're working like on the deal itself, like how do you kind of go about determining? Yeah, so that's the million dollar question, right? And that <laughs> comes with experience, right? Right now, everybody's telling you they're putting rents up 15% and the costs are only going up 2% and interest rates are never going to rise. Um, you know, so a lot <laughs> that's of people crazy. say, like, I'll look at a deal and I look at a ton of deals. And then there's another show on Thursday nights called Shark Pool, if you ever get a chance to go to it. Yeah, yeah, I try to attend that almost and every so week. You go to those and you say to people, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna renovate all the apartments in six months. Well, how are you going to do that? Some tenants still have eight, nine, ten months on their lease. You can't renovate an apartment while it's still occupied. So you need to look at, is this realistic, right? So there was one deal that presented, it was only 50% occupied. So they said in the first two months, we're renovating 50% of the units. That plan makes sense because they're empty. And they, this was a big value add. Um, but often, so if you look at all the apartments, it can take you, that's why a normal recovery plan is about 18 months. And you may not be able to renovate enough quickly. So you may need to renew somebody and then catch them on the next turn, depending on how busy your team is, how much resources they are, you know, even right now, can I get enough refrigerators and stoves and uh, different things? Um, so it, you got to make sure you have a real balanced plan. And that is a lot of people overestimate their plan. I, I, a lot of deals I look at, it's an overestimated that we're going to get this done in this shorter period of a time. Yeah, that's exactly what, like, I, I see a lot. And I'm like, how do you, like, it, it, it's really a balancing act, I guess, to really determine, like, how much you can do out of, like, so quickly. What about, like, smaller value add stuff, like, valet trash, internet cable? Like, how do you, do you just, like, have, like, like from experience, like, you know, I can do this in this market or, like, I know I can, like, charge this much for internet and it's only going to cost me this much? Like, how do yeah. you find that, that out? So you're definitely going to look at comps for that, right? So is okay. this something that's common with the other competitive? And comps are even a big thing. People say, oh, this is my comp. And if you actually drove it, it's not their comp. Um, you know, it's a much nicer property. So I've been where brokers have said, oh, you can raise the rates to this place. And then I went to the town and I'm like, there's no way I can match this place. It's so much nicer. It's like night and day. Like, there's no way I can get these $120 rent bumps they're talking about um, again, coming in as a renter, this, it was, it was totally, it wasn't apples and apples, right? You need to get an apples and apples rent comp. And that's harder to do as looking at a deal as a passive investor and stuff. And, you know, I've spent a lot of energy looking at these things. So I got a little bit of an eye for it, but, uh, you know, 
the comps are very difficult to get. Um, and comps in certain markets can change dramatically. You know, I call it the other side of the railroad tracks, right? But you know, if this property is the other side of the railroad tracks and you're saying I'm gonna do as well as the guys on the good side of the railroad tracks, um, that, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. And, and then again, that's all part of the plan and that you hope that they can execute their plan, which is the role of the asset manager. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and and it, there was a question of other resources. So there's tons of podcasts and stuff. Um, I'll put my contact info in here too. So if people want to reach out to me, um, you know, that we can definitely um, connect. And, you know, I'm happy to share. So there's, whoop, there's tons of podcasts. I've just been obsessed with learning this information. Unfortunately, they're not doing their asset management training course anymore. Um, but, um, you know, it's uh, definitely, and I'm even gonna put my calendar in here just to save you having to email me and then email it back if you want to book a time to talk. Uh, I love talking about stuff and sharing information. So Ken had a question as well. Feel free to unmute, Ken. Uh, first of all, thanks, thanks, Trevor. Uh, great, great info as always. And I know that people like Lawrence, you know, not paying rent. I think, I think we need to put those guys out right away. I, I think we need to put them out of the meetup room. But uh, a couple of questions is I've dealt with my wide variety of property managers, and you know, it's always a, a task. But my first one sort of um, uh, ties into what Ashley was saying as far as what key metrics or what key information. Do you pull from the underwriting or would you think an asset manager needs from the underwriting going forward as far as it is like, you know, dollars per unit, uh, break even occupancy? What are some of the key things like either an underwriter needs to provide the asset manager or the asset manager like looks at the under and goes, hey, you know, you know, yeah, that makes sense or not. Yeah. Um, so in the ideal world, world, there underwriters are working with their asset managers on their team, working with their people and verifying are these realistic expectations? You know, unfortunately it doesn't always happen, right? You know, there's, uh, there's, there's a bunch of new people that just graduated out of somebody's mentoring program and they're off their underwriting. Um, and and it, it can definitely, you wanna look at the whole strength of the team before you give that team your money. I mean, do they have the people on, on, on their team to actually go and execute it, right? Um, I will never invest in a deal where there's not somebody who's part of the GP team that's, that's within very close distance to the actual property. Um, I just won't, it's, it's a personal quirk of mine. Um, I wanna make sure that somebody has that boots on the ground that can, can drive the process. Um, I know how hard it was for me as a volunteer asset manager, two hours away. I mean, in 10 months, I did 12,780 miles. You would think crazy to track it, but I was hoping to get repaid for it, but I didn't. <laughs> but, but they definitely should, pe people in an office, you know, I call it the fat old people in the office making the plan for the guys actually going out and do the work. Um, hopefully you never get involved in a deal like that. The guy that's, the guy or girl, pardon me, um, who's going up there and doing the work really needs to be on board with the plan and implementing the plan. And two, like you, you see a lot, especially like in the mid-size um, like properties, like the 20 to 50 that may have like mom and pop um, or some type of, um, you know, that, that aren't professionally managed. Either it's the yeah. owners are self-managing or you have some single family property managers trying to manage them. That, that's where I think you get the most, as you say, like challenges yeah. in, 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 in ownership. Um, how do you sort of, like spot some red flags or look for those opportunities in like where you where you can prove the management just by doing like your say not physical on the ground due diligence but say you know you, you look at the financials and something like that what are, are some red flags on hey this property might not be be managed uh to its fullest extent yeah so for me personally i have not looked at properties small enough that can't afford property management on site so even if 48 is really borderline, 
and I try to find like a property manager that can give me part-time support in that. You know, I've been looking for units, I call it 72 and above, where for sure you can at least afford to have two full-time people with a real property management company. I'm not an expert in the small, like undersized ones. Um, you know, I've never, never looked at anything smaller than 48 and even the 48 I made an offer with a friend of mine owned a nicer 48 around the corner and we were going to share property managers. And the goal was when I improved that property, he could improve his property because that property was holding down his rates and we wouldn't compete. His was always going to be nicer. And so, you know, there's not, not the competing interests on the property manager and we were gonna share them 50-50 and then maintenance was just gonna be billed out as they worked. Um, and that made, but we didn't win the deal, unfortunately. Um, but that was the only way I could see making something that small work. Mr. International, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. And pay the rent, man, pay the rent, come on. We've got, we're, we're flying all over, taking people out for dinner. You need the check? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, Mark, thank you for this presentation tonight. They put this together, and Trevor, thank you for the information. Great, great, great presentation. Um, you know, I, I hear anybody talking about rent, raising rent. What are other ways? What are other ways to increase the bottom line other than raising rent? Yeah. Because I'm looking at, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm looking at like on the news yesterday. Rents are going up, and I'm just saying you, you're going to only raise but so much after a while. You know, so yeah. what's, what are other ways that people can, can, can get the bottom, uh, fat in the bottom line up? Yeah, so you can only squeeze so much juice out of the lemon, right? Cutting costs, right? There are costs. So for example, I'm, I'm actually looking to put an offer in on a property. It's ridiculous. They've got seven staff members for 154 units. It's like I'm cutting that to three um, real quick, maybe four um, just on the turn. You know, it's a lot of bodies. So you look for efficiencies that way. Um, you look for tech and automation, you know, mm -hmm. so can you put everything online? All the rent payments are online. All of the tenant portals are online. So when you put in a trouble ticket, you, you don't go to the office and call the office and talk to the lady. You have an app on your phone and you put in. So those kind of things can really save you money in the long run. There's an initial investment for it, but definitely save you money in the long run. Obviously, water conservation has been for a long time, right? Cutting the water bills. And so a lot of places, for example, the one I'm looking at now, it's all bills paid. We're looking to put in water conservation. And then in the second year of operation, start introducing rubs um, on the water. So cut, cut the cost of water so it's not a $75 heart attack. Now it's a $35 increase. Um, so it's, it's a little easier to swallow. Obviously, there's low-hanging fruit from pet fees, late fees, um, valet trash we already talked about, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, preferred parking, covered parking. Um, I've even heard some people now on certainly on higher class. Um, I got a friend and I'm a passive investor actually in the land. And I keep bugging them that when they build the apartment, it's behind a Tesla factory. They need to put solar powered uh, carports. <laughs> and then you can now now you can get a couple hundred bucks for it and plug your Tesla into the into the and 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 the sunshine charges your Tesla because <coughs> Elon's got to pay for you know Twitter somehow and uh, so but you know kind of all of those things so so it's amazing how much the pennies nickels and dimes can add up mm -hmm. right so if you get a little bit of crease on the income you get a bunch of added values that aren't necessarily rent related. And then you shave a little bit off the costs, you know, you can start to make some significant difference, right? So even three or 4% on the rent, another 10, 20%, cause it's a smaller number of amenity charges and fees and different things. Um, I got a property, I didn't think they could pull it off, but I'm a passive in and they did valet trash. And they're charging 35 bucks and paying somebody 12 bucks to pick the trash up. Um, now I might've picked the trash up for six bucks. I don't know. Um, Cause I'm, you know, but it's, and you know, it's 105 units. And so now all of a sudden 105 units making an extra 20 bucks a month, all straight 100% to the bottom line. Um, that's significant. And you can do that on a couple of things. Um, then you can make a big difference. 
Um, a lot of people aren't pushing pet fees. So a big thing I talked about, one of the deals that fell through, but you know, we were gonna put a lot of pet, amen pet amenities into the property, a free pet washing station. Part of it was so we could keep track of who had a dog and, and so we could charge them the pet rent and uh, you know, make sure that they're paying, paying that uh, pet rent and you know, have bones at the office. And when you, know, when you come in and finally pay your rent, Mr. International, you bring your little dog with you and we give them a free bone. Um, now I know you got a dog. I look at your lease and I'm like, man, he doesn't have a dog on the lease. This is 25 bucks a month pet fee charge. Oh, thank you, Trevor. Thank you. And we all know you pay the rent. You're just thank fun you, to Trevor. pick on. That's it. There you go. Like a good idea, like my last argument, hey, when we did our due diligence walkthrough, just like through the thing when we were buying it, like we made notes of who had pets on my, my tenure. Like one person had it on their lease. And five of them had, had pets. So yeah. that's another way I ended up going with the new, like new pen was coming on board, but that's another way to capture those pets is just, you know, do a pet audit during due diligence. Yep. You know, and guys like Lawrence having like a, like, like, you know, the two dogs, three cats and stuff like that. The Mr. International Exotic Pet Store going yep. on, you can catch them. But my deal that just imploded was 240 units and we discovered 60 apartments that had pets that weren't on the lease, 60. That's wow. 60 times 25 bucks is all right. Wow, definitely. So I'm not sure if you um if you answered Allison's question, but she asked, aside from best in class, what other resources have you benefited from to, to then utilize in your role as an asset manager? Yeah, so I was really lucky that they were doing, they did a training class back when Gary and Kyle were partners and I, I went to their free one and then I went to their paid one. Um, and it, it was awesome, you know, it was uh, 12 one hour courses that they personally gave and went through it all. So it definitely learned a lot um, that way. And I don't, you know, it's interesting for how much, how important asset management is to our industry, how little, focus and resources there are on it, um, you know, and, and uh, the, but there's definitely podcasts. I, I know Kenneth posted, um, Gary Lipsky's got a great podcast and there's a couple of other ones. Disrupt Equity also has a really good podcast um, on asset management. Awesome. Uh, Matthew, you can unmute yourself and ask your question, sir. Hello guys. Um, I was wondering when, would you recommend that somebody start outsourcing asset management? I have some smaller properties that I asset manage myself. I have a property manager, but I do the asset management myself. And now I'm looking into syndications and things like that. And a lot of stuff with the smaller properties are falling through the cracks. Like I forgot to set up auto pay on insurance. You know, something doesn't get paid on time. At what point do you recommend somebody start outsourcing um, asset management versus yeah, doing so it there's a, there's a big difference between outsourcing tasks and outsourcing the ultimate responsibility, right? So if you can get an admin that does a lot of the tasks that you track, in theory, you can still stay responsible. And, you know, the hardest thing is, right, to, to give up responsibility to a paid individual versus an investor. Um, it's this fine line, right, of what, what are you going to get? Um, and so to get the quality, you're going to need some scale to get the quality. Because if you hire a third party to manage a third party, um, man, you're just, you're third party yourself into headaches. Um, unless you're sizable, right? And then you have some influence, right? You know, if you've got 10,000 apartment doors, which I don't think anyone this call does um, yet, we're all going to eventually, um, then you can do things like that. And uh, I'll be honest, when I first did a volunteer asset manager, I was supposed to help an asset manager. And the stuff I found um, got him fired within a week. It was, it was amazing. I mean, he was the guy who told them to hide the invoices so he wasn't over budget. He was the guy who told them to not count skips so that we were over 90% occupied when we were actually 82% economic occupied. And I called up the owner and said, listen, do you want, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I got a lot of bad news. And, uh, you know, so sometimes people kind of to preserve their own jobs, right? Nobody, nobody loves your money as much as you love your money. So, you know, try to, try to grow and take on a partner. Try to grow and find somebody in these networks that's in your neighborhood that wants to help you and do stuff with you. And then mentor them into some sort of role. 
and and you know make it performance based versus just pay based. Okay, that thank you so much. Advice. Quick uh, quick follow up question for someone that's looking to get in, to move from small multifamily to large multifamily. What resources would you recommend to get all the knowledge on the more complex financing and all the different parts that go into it? So either surround yourself with good partners that are already doing it, that you can bring value to them because your specific local knowledge. I mean, that's how I'm trying to get in deals, right? I've been standing up and down, jumping. I'm in Texas. I want to work. If you don't live in Texas and you want to buy places in Texas, you got my number. And I mean, I've driven, like, I went to Lubbock just on the whim that hopefully if they win the deal, I'll get on the deal. And, you know, I drove to Lubbock. I walked the property. I stayed at night. Um, and all at my own expense, just again, to hope to get there. So try to try to find people that are willing to do that with you and then join, join with other people and bring them value and they bring you value of their experience. That's my best suggestion. And then obviously mentoring, right? There's, there's no perfect mentoring program. They all got their flaws and their good things, but you're going to get involved in a network if you join some sort of mentoring program. And so you're going to not only get education, you're going to get connections, camaraderie, um, people that you can do deals with and work with. Um, and, you know, I don't recommend any, I'm, I have three different programs that I'm part of, but I don't necessarily recommend any because they're, they're, they're individual to what you need, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and from where you're going, um, I said I wouldn't say any, but like Jake and Gina, right? They're, most of their students are exactly what you're doing. They're small multifamily going to bigger. Um, and, you know, a bunch. I'm not part of their program, but I have a ticket to go to their conference in, in Orlando later this year. It's a great conference. And uh, same with Rod Kalief and his Warriors. He's a little more that way as well. And then you got the big guys that just basically teaching you, you know, the underwriting and the, the bigger picture stuff. Okay. Thank you so much. But surrounding awesome. yourself awesome. with a team, right? This is a team sport. And so putting people on your team that I'm going to be honest, I can underwrite. I try, I can read underwriting. I can tell you what to put in the underwriting, but it's a big crip. If, if I was Superman and you opened Excel spreadsheet, all my superpowers would be gone. Um, but I can read it and I can tell you if it's baloney, but I can't manipulate it. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> I'm glad to know that I'm not. Good stuff, good stuff. Does anyone else have any final questions before we do one or two breakout rooms and start connecting with, with each other? Yeah, so free to great, unmute great now. Turnout. Thanks, Mark. Oh, thank you, Trevor. I appreciate it. Some great so questions. does anyone else have any last questions or comments or anything feel free to do so now or forever hold your peace and be sure to connect with me if you want to talk more awesome awesome so yes a few house um clean housekeeping rules make sure you drop your connection um info in the chat so we all can connect with you whether it's linkedin email or whatever you want Make sure you do that now so we can connect with you. Also, the replay to this amazing um, event and discussion will be posted on the Goose YouTube channel. I will drop the, the link in the chat once again. So it will air tomorrow morning uh, by 9 a.m., 10 a.m., the latest. So be on there so you can watch the replay. And if you have any questions, as Trevor mentioned, um, feel free to connect with him as well, and um, he can answer any further questions. And last but not least, I uh, want to take a, a group picture with your lovely faces. So if you're able to, uh, feel free to, you know, take off your, um, jump on the camera, you know, patch your hair, whatever you have to do. And let's take yeah. a snapshot. And Mr. International, I got to get our hair just right. Yeah, yeah, Lawrence, Lawrence, Lawrence needs to fix it. <laughs> He needs to fix his hair. Get the beard going, you. <laughs> You're on mute, Lawrence. <laughs> when the hair's right, the business is tight. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So let's do this. Big smile, everyone. One, two, three. Uh oh. Sorry. What happened here?
Perfect. Got the cam. Just do it one more time just to make sure. Big smile. One, two, three. Perfect. All right. So that said, we're going to jump into the breakout part of the room. If you guys are going to jump out, we appreciate you jumping on. We appreciate you being here with us. Uh, we will definitely connect with you guys in social media land and virtual space until we can shake hands in person. But for those who are willing to stay, we're going to jump into a few breakout rooms and get connected. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you.